so much. Let's go and grab our Bibles, open up to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number four. Hebrews chapter four, as we continue on in our series of prayer. Lessons on prayer. We've gone through Job's lessons on prayer. We might have more from him later. We've gone some lessons on prayer from David. Now we're going to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number four. We'll spend a few weeks in this verse learning from this very powerful, famous verse. Verse, when we start reading it, when you see it, you'll probably notice it and know it and be very familiar with it. But it's a very good and powerful verse. Hebrews chapter number four. Read one verse and then we'll pray and jump into it this evening, have a little bit of a reminder, and then we'll uh, go into this uh, new, new portion of our series here on prayer. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 16, the Bible says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us pray. Dear Father, I pray to help us. Help us, Father, to surrender to you. Help us, Father, to listen to you. Help us, Father, to be as the one disciple that said, teach us to pray. Help us, Father, to be in the minority of Christians and people, the minority of churches, the minority of men and women that would say, I want to pray. I desire to pray. Help that to be us, Father. Help us to be consumed with the idea of learning how to pray in a way that would please and honor you. Father, I pray that every word that I say would be an honor and glory to you and would be what you want. Father, help me. Help us. Help us to learn to be more like you and to honor and glorify you in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Thank you. You may be seated. So obviously in the past few weeks on Sunday evenings, we've been going through this series on prayer. It's, it's an amazing thing. It's wonderful to see how the Lord works uh, because I, I had no intentions of starting a series on prayer. The only series that I really thought about was the Thursday nights with the First Timothy's uh, series because that's what teaches you about the man of God. That's what First Timothy 3 is all about. And I knew this is something very important that we need to go over. So our church family, so me and all of us individuals, know what God expects for us to find. So that was the only thing that I really had on any mind of like going over in a series type of fashion. But I, I had to find a book for something that I needed to do. I was trying to find something and you know I was on Amazon. I found the book and you know how Amazon does. They have all their suggestions and things like that. And this book popped up on there. It was a Charles Haddon Spurgeon book uh, about prayer and spiritual warfare. I'm like, well, you know, I might need that. <laughs> so I bought the book because um, I had nothing else to do with my life. So I bought another book. Um, and, and so I bought the book and I, I got it and uh, I didn't really read the whole description or the cover. <laughs> uh, and it said, and when I got it, six books in one and it's very big. <laughs> I'm like, ah, great. <laughs> uh, so I have this book now and I began reading it and man, I was challenged. I, I was moved with how inept my prayer is and how little I know about prayer and how much prayer is so powerful and so needed and such of a great importance. In all facets and all ways, prayer is of the utmost. As John R. Ice would say, all, prayers, all, all failures are prayer failures. All failures are prayer failures. It's either a fact of I'm not praying in the right mindset, or I'm not praying for the right things, or I'm just not praying, period. Yeah. Or, or it could be the Psalm 51 of, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. It could just be that I know it's hitting off the tin roof and coming back down. But, that does not change the fact that it's a prayer failure. It's a failure of myself to fix my prayer life. And church family, I believe one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, why God allowed that to happen and why God pushed this way to go a series on prayer is because of what we are in right now. 
Because church family, it's of the utmost importance that every single one of us, not just me, not just the men of the pulpit committee, not just the staff men, not just the deacons, it's important that every single one of us as a church family learn to pray because we are faced with a very spiritual decision that can only be properly chosen and can only be properly followed if you learn to pray. Jesus Christ told his disciples, he says, watch ye and pray lest ye enter into temptation. You have a weak prayer life, I guarantee you're going to have a hard time staying out of sin. You see, because Daniel was able to stand strong on his beliefs. Daniel was able to stand strong and obey God and not man because of his prayer life. Because the most time he spent with any living being was the time he spent with God. Every day, three times a day, open his windows toward Jerusalem and he would pray. That's a testimony. And that's better than any of our prayer lives, guarantee. 100% guarantee he had a better prayer life than you or I. Probably than most of us combined, he probably had a better prayer life. Because I don't know about you, I, I, I don't think I'd be cool and calm and okay knowing I'm about to get thrown into a den of lions. But the Bible gives no inkling that he was fretful or fearful at all. Or also, we could also look at his, his brethren, the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said, we're not careful to answer the O king. You know, I think they probably had a very similar prayer line to Daniel because they were not afraid of the king. The one that was about to throw them into the fiery furnace. The one that the fiery furnace was so hot that when they just opened the doors, it killed the men that was throwing them in there. That's how hot it was. So let's not play it down and, oh, you know, make all the excuses. No, it was legitimate fire. It was legitimate death. And the men that were throwing them in there died before they could even throw them in. And they said, we're not careful to answer thee. You see, because they had more of time on their knees than they did in the real world, quote, unquote. They spent more time with their God than they did with any other living being because they understood this is the most important thing. Amen. And so church family, I believe God has led us down this path of learning so much about prayer because we have a very important decision that lies ahead of us and every single one of us needs to be able to find the throne of grace and beseech it with all of our pint, with all of our ability and combine all the things we've been learning about prayer, ordering our cause. Let me make sure I go to the Lord prepared, that I'm not just going willy-nilly, whatever one at a time, whatever it may be. No, I, I plan and I prepare myself and I fill my mouth with arguments. I look through the Bible and I know why am I asking and what does God say about it and has he already promised it to me? Is there any attributes about God? Is there any history of God already doing it for someone else? Has God already done it for me? These are the things God is looking for. He's looking for the prepared and the planned Christian to come before him and say, I need you. And we learned about David as soul confessing. Oh, I, I, I'm poor and needy. I, I'm a wicked man. I have done sin. Not just that, but I can't do anything. I am unable, and you are the only one that is able. See, that's what God is looking for. He's looking for the honest and the man of integrity to step up and to be truthful with him and to be honest with him. That's what he's waiting for. And church family, it's of the utmost. It's of the highest caliber that you and I learn to pray and get serious about the art and the battlefield of prayer because if not, our future could be very bleak. It could be very dark if we do not get serious about this thing of prayer, about the beauty of prayer. Because we have a very important decision that lies ahead of us. That if we, as I preached on Sunday, last Sunday morning, right in our own eyes, if we just go because it makes sense to me, because it looks good to me, it passes my eye test, that's not what God's looking for. That won't do anything. That won't float in God's e economy. God says, no, you do what I tell you to do. And you go the way I want you to go. But pray tell, how are you going to know what God wants you to do if you haven't spent a blessed minute with him in prayer. Yeah, How is God going to tell you this is what you need to do if you won't even give him the light of day? If you won't even set time aside for him? So Christian, 
I know it's a challenging series, and it should be. Prayer is probably one of the most challenging subjects to preach upon because it's so needed, it's so powerful, it's so true, but we really don't do it. But if all this is is a convicting message, a convicting series, it tickles your ears, it makes you feel good because you come down and pray about it, but that's it, then that's all it's going to be for you. A good tickle to the ear, and that's it. Because if you do not have the determination to make it a part of your life, it is good for nothing. It is a waste. So do not allow it to be a waste. Take the challenge and make it a part of your life because it is paramount. Our very church hangs in the balance. And we need Christians of conviction to find the place on their knees and to get one-on-one -on -one with the creator of the universe and say, I need your wisdom. I need it more than anything else. I don't need understanding of men. I don't need understanding of men's wisdom. I need you. And that will only come when the man, when the woman, when the child of God gets serious about this thing of prayer. So do not allow it to slip away. Do not allow it just to be a good challenging thought, a good challenging message. You know, allow it to be a changing message. But once again, as I said this morning, it's your decision. And let me remind you, every decision you make is a decision. If you choose not to come to the altar, that's a decision that you made. If you choose not to apply these truths to your life, that's a decision that you have made. Not moving is not a, I didn't decide. No, you made a decision. You decided not to. And God knows that. And God sees that. And God will hold you accountable for that. God's not in this to play games. God did not give you life to make a game out of it. God did not give you this opportunity to make light of it. God says, I have chosen you. As he said of Esther, as Mordecai said to Esther, he says, for such a time as this. Could it be that God has chosen each and every single one of us to be at the Anchor Baptist Church for such a time as this? And he is waiting to see the Christians that are willing to stand up, or should I say, kneel down and get serious about this thing of prayer. How important is it to you? How important is your walk with God with you? Because your walk with God is only fueled and is only as strong as the time you spend on your knees as a time that you spend prostrate before the Lord in prayer. Church family, of the utmost importance, learn to pray. God desires to teach. God desires to show. As the Bible says, he wants to show his strong and mighty arm. But he's waiting for the Christians to pray. He's waiting for the Christians to ask. He's waiting to give us clarity and guidance. He's waiting to tell us, this is what you need to do. I've been waiting for you to ask, this is what you need. He's waiting for us to show it's important to us. And we talked about the urgent, the soul-grasping God. Jacob, all night, said, I will not let go. God's not looking for the quick five-minute prayer, oh, I know everything now. No, God's looking for those that this is serious. You show seriousness by consistency and by the oftenness of the prayer and by showing God, no matter how long it takes, I will keep asking. That's what he said of the one widow with the unjust judge. He said because she kept on asking, she got the, the, the judgment that she desired because she was consistent in her plea and the judge finally said, okay, I'll do it. Just stop asking. He's trying to teach us. God wants to see how serious you are about it. You see, the unjust judge found out, you know, if I don't give her what she wants, she's not going to stop. But I wonder if God knows, just give him a week. They'll stop asking. Just give them a little bit of time and it'll wear off. The emotion will fade away and then we'll see the true character and that's going to stop real quick. 
See, it's easy to pray when you're filled with emotion, when you're filled with what umption and all that good stuff. And that's great, but the character is what shows, and that's what God's waiting for. He's waiting for the emotion and, the, and all the frivolities to wear off, and he wants to see when it's just you and me, how long are you going to stay? Jacob showed, it's just you and me, God, and I'm not leaving. Except you bless me, I'm not letting go. Can you imagine that? That's a wonderful thing. Church family, don't just allow this to be a good, challenging series. Change. Change. But you, only you can change. I can't change you. I can only change me. You're the only person that can change you. And that's between you and God. You have to make that decision for yourself that I am going to get serious about this thing of prayer. And then maybe God will get serious about what we need. Maybe God will then say, wow, they really want my advice. They really want me to put my input. I will. Just like he did with Jacob. Just like he did with the Syrophoenician woman. God may put you through some hoops to see how serious you are. He may ignore you. He may say no. He may call you a dog. But he just wants to see how serious you are. Twelve years, the woman with the issue of blood. Imagine that. Twelve years of the same problem, and she spent all of her living. Imagine that. Having nothing left because she spent it all. I know. I'll go to Christ. He's the one that can help. How about a church family? How serious is prayer to you? How serious prayer is to you is how serious God will be about answering your prayers. If you're not serious about it, then God won't be serious about it. Okay, that's fine. God says, okay, you're not serious about praying. Okay, then I'm not serious about answering. But once you show me you're serious... I'll show up, and I'll show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. That's a promise of God. He says, call unto me, and I will show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I don't know about you, but I would like to see the things that I don't know about. I would like to see the God of the unknown show the great and mighty things. But I can't make that decision for you. That's a you decision. How important it is to you. Let's go on here in our series of prayer. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Christian true prayer is the soul entering into the presence of God. Let that sink in. When you pray. When you are truly praying. You are legitimately entering before God himself in the throne room of the king. It's not merely the utterance of words. It's not just a great feeling or desire, although those are parts of prayer. Prayer is words. Prayer is parts of desire. But that's not just what it is. That, that's prayers of the world. That's prayers of other religions. No, no, this, this is something of a true and legitimate nature that when you pray, truly praying, not just saying words into the ether and the atmosphere, but no, when you're truly praying, you legitimately have your soul in front of God himself, in the throne room of the Almighty. True prayer is neither a mental exercise nor a vocal performance. And if that's all prayer is to you, then you're not praying. Okay, let me be very frank with you. If prayer is a mental exercise or a vocal performance, don't even try. You're not praying, and God says, okay, good for you. As he said to the Pharisees, you have your reward. If that's all it is to you, if you treat prayer as a means of a, ooh, let me see if I can figure out how to uh, work this or, or puzzle this out, or let me see if I can, I, I can impress everyone with what I'm saying, or can I impress God? God says, have it. That's your reward. 
you're not going to get an answer from me because you got your own reward. That's all you wanted. It was a mental exercise. It was a vocal performance. You got it. Good job. That's all you get. Is that all it is to you? Because that's not true prayer. That's a vain and prideful action. That's not prayer. That, that, that has no place in prayer. Mental exercise and vocal performance, all those things ha have nothing to do with prayer. And if that's even slightly in your mind, forget about it. Because God says, no. You're in here trying to impress me. Forget about it. I'm not a respecter of man. You'll never impress God. So don't try. Prayer is a spiritual conversation. It's the commerce of the soul with the creator of all. It's a conversation, a back and forth between us and the king of heaven, the ruler of eternity. And I am allowed to have a commerce, a back and forth, a trade between myself and the king of kings. John 4, 24 says, God is a spirit, and them that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You see, this is not something that's seen by the eyes of mortal man. That's not what prayers is. When, when I pray, I don't actually see the throne room of God. I, I don't see those things. It's not meant for the eyes of man. It's meant for the spirit of man. He said, God is spirit, and, and we must worship him in spirit and truth. So, so prayer is something that's supposed to be perceived by the spiritual man, not by the natural man, not by the mortal man. That's not what prayer is about. In fact, prayer has nothing to do with the flesh. Prayer is the everything but the flesh. It's all about the spiritual nature. You see, the only way we can perceive by the inner man, the only way that spirituality can be achieved is by following, get this, the Holy Spirit. If he's not living inside of you, guess what? You can't be spiritual because your spirit is literally dead if you do not have the spirit living inside of you. So it says in the book of Galatians, he said the spirit hath quickened you. Quickened means brought to life. Well, when, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit brings that spirit alive inside of you. And now you have the opportunity to truly have that understanding and conversation with God. Because if you desire to have a conversation with the Lord, it has to be done in the spirit. Because God is a spirit. And that they want to worship him, must worship him in spirit and in truth. So, I want to pray. I need to make sure I understand the ground rules. It's a spiritual act. And I have to have the Holy Spirit living inside of me. And I need his guidance. I need him guiding me. He lives, he lives inside of you because of salvation, but he fills you because of submission. And, and to truly have that true prayer, you need to have a complete submission to the Holy Spirit. Because if you don't, then he cannot guide you whichever way he will. If you're not truly submitted to him, Through our spirit, we can discern the leading of the Holy Spirit. We can learn from him. We can grow. We can commune with him. And we can set a request before him and receive answers. That's the power that we have of prayer. We get to go before God himself and have a communication, have a conversation. We get to, we get to bring our request to God and we get to receive answers of peace and love from God Almighty. But that's only attainable through the work of the Holy Spirit, through the guiding of the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit quickening and filling. But that's, once again, your decision. See, prayer is a spiritual work. It's a spiritual business, beginning to end, through and through. Nothing to do with flesh. Nothing to do with natural man. It's all the inner man. It's all the new man. That's all it is. It's a spiritual business. The aim and end of prayer is to reach God himself, not man. If you're trying to pray to unlock something deep inside of you, that's not, that's not what prayer is about. Prayer is about reaching God. 
Not reaching yourself. Not tickling yourself and making yourself feel good and, oh, I feel so good. No, no, no. That's not what prayer is about. Prayer is about reaching God. If that's all you're praying for, you're not praying right. That may be a side effect of true prayer, but that should not be the aim of prayer because that's self-serving. See, everything I do should be done with the aim of Christ being glorified. In fact, that's the second part that is needed. You see, to have prayer, to have true prayer, I have to, it can only be truly accomplished with the aid of the Holy Spirit. But to have prevailing power in prayer, I must have the blood of the Christ, the blood of the Holy One, the blood of the Messiah, the power of Him. You see, I only get the blank check from God because it's signed with the blood of Christ. He says, take this to the Father. Ask in my name, and he won't turn you away. God says, that's my son's name. I'll give you whatever you ask. He has given you this. He has given you the power of receiving and requesting at his request. Ask what you want, and I will give it. If prayer were of lips alone then prayer would be of the easiest action. If all prayer was was just me speaking, then why? Then, then prayer wouldn't be a big deal. Speaking is one of the easiest things we can do. Making noise with their mouth. In fact, that's one of the first things human beings do once they're born. They begin crying. They begin making noise with their mouth. So prayer is much more than just lips. Oh, oh, it's so much more than just speaking words. If prayer was only by desire, then everyone would be effectual, fervent prayer warriors. Everyone would have, have their will and way with God because everyone is moved by desire. Oh, no matter what they say, everyone has strong desire. Everyone does. Might not be up to the same thing, but we all have our own areas of strong and fervent desire. So why aren't we seeing more answers to prayer? Why aren't we seeing God moving more? Because that's not what prayer is about. Prayer is not about the lips. Prayer is not about speaking. Prayer is not about my strong desire. That's not what prayer is. But those properly fitted in the spiritual realm with the guiding of the Holy Spirit, that's when it's feasible. When the guidance and the teacher of the Holy Spirit guides those, that's when they have power. That's when God says, now, now you're getting it because you're allowing the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to guide and teach you this is what you need to say to the Father. Here, let me, I'll even help you. The Bible even says that the Holy Spirit will even go to God on our behalf and say, look, he doesn't even know what he's asking for. This is what he needs. Which, once again, is such a, <laughs> such a humbling thing. It's like, God, they're so inept, they don't even know what to ask for. Let me do it for him. But he will only do that if we're submitted to him. If we're not submitted to him, he says, okay, ask what you want. But if we're truly at the place of, I, I don't even know what to ask for. I just, I, I, need your, I need your guidance. He says, okay, I'll go to the Father. I'll help you out. Do you have that submission with the Holy Spirit? You see, I want to have true prayer. He, the Holy Spirit, must be present through all of it. Otherwise, it will be an exercise in futility. Oh, it would be a good vocal performance. Oh, it would be a good mental exercise. But if the Holy Spirit's not there guiding and helping, just chalk that time up because it was a waste. God's not looking for you. He's looking for your submission. He's not looking at how great you are. He's looking at how humble you are, how ready you are to submit to the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, true prayer is not attainable. 
The only thing we'll offer if we don't have the Holy Spirit it might have the name, it might even have the form of prayer, but the substance, the necessary ingredients will never be present. As we talked about on Thursday, it'd be like making a batch of cookies with no sugar, chocolate chip cookies with no sugar and no chocolate chips. They look like cookies. You can call them chocolate chip cookies, but believe me, they ain't tasting like chocolate chip cookies. The Holy Spirit must be the guide. You must be submitted to the Holy Spirit, but you also have to go with the Son of God. You cannot have true prayer without the Holy Spirit. You cannot have prevailing power without the Son of God. You want to have power in prayer? You have to go with Christ. Just imagine this. Think, put yourself in God's place. You sent your son to be the example, to be the savior. And then these peons that have rejected and rebelled now are coming to pray to you and they're not even coming with Christ at their side. They're not even coming with the blessing of the Christ. With, that, with Christ, Christ isn't even on their mind. We don't even care if it glorifies Christ because it's all about me. Oh, I need this. Oh, I will you help, me out, help me out with this. I need your help, God. Please give me wisdom about this. But we're not even worried about Christ. We could be asking for the right thing, but if Christ isn't even on our mind, if he isn't even at the forefront, what are you doing? God's insulted. He says, you dare come to me. And my son isn't on your lips. My son isn't in your mind. How dare you come to me? How dare us? Come to God, making a request of him. And his son isn't even in the realm of our thought process. Because it's just my problems and what I'm facing and blah, blah, blah. Me, me, me. God says, okay, what about my son? What about the one I gave? See, God has given you prayer, and you don't even have the decency to pray with the son of God and with his preeminence in mind. God's saying, I'm waiting for you to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but be in step with my son and have him in thought. Father, I, I need this because I believe it will be an honor and glory to you. And I believe it will give praise to Christ because of this, this, and this. God says, okay, yeah. That's what he means when he says this signed blank check with the name of Christ. I'm saying, God, this is all about your son. It, it might help me, but that's not why I'm here. It might be of a help to me, but I'm here more on the fact that it would be an honor and it would bless and put Christ in the place of prominence. The man that tries to pray, tries to show the desire of his heart, and is without the blood of Christ powering his petition. It's not sprinkled with the blood of the Holy One. It has not been dressed with the sacrifice of the Messiah. You might as well be Cain and bring your fruits to the sacrifice. And God will say, okay, what do you want me to do? Give you a round of applause. Because I'm not blessing that. Because you didn't listen to me. It's very simple. God said, come with my son. With his blood. Ask in his name. And I'll give you anything. It's pretty simple. So why isn't it happening? Maybe it's because... We're not asking in his name. Oh, we say, in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, good for you. You have found a good word to say. Once again, God could care less about your words and your vocal performance. He wants to know, what do you mean? He's waiting for us to be like Jacob and prove. All night long, he held on. He lost full mobility of his leg for the rest of his life, and he hung on. He was commanded by God, let me go, and he hung on. You see, if God is just worried about Jacob's words, 
he would have blessed him right at the beginning. But no, he says, I want to see you mean it. I want you to show me. Oh, you may say in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, that's good. That's right. But God says, show it to me. Show me that it's about Jesus' name. Show me that it's about the prominent one. Show me it's about the Messiah. Then I'll give you everything you ask. Anything you ask. But until then, rejection. Until your plea is truly shown by our actions to be bathed in the blood of Christ. Until then, God will say, show me. Don't just say it. Show me. See, prayer is not just words. Prayer is an action. It's the action of the Spirit, communing with God. You see, true prayer is led by the Holy Spirit and presented by Christ. Because once again, 1 Timothy chapter 2 teaches us Christ is our intercessor. Intercessor means praying on the behalf of someone else. Christ sits on the right hand of God all the time. He intercedes for you and for me. Every second of every day, Christ prays on your behalf. He's praying on your behalf to God. And yet we still have no power with God. I don't think it's Christ's problem. I don't think it's the Holy Spirit. I don't think God's rejecting them. So there's only one thing left in the equation. I am the problem. I am not praying the way I should. Because the windows of heaven should be open. Whatever I ask, God should give because he made that promise. Once again, God cannot lie. He made a promise. So it's not him. It has to be us. How's it going? Let's look at the different aspects of this first. And to see the image and the action of prayer. What does Paul say here in the book of Hebrews? He says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. When Christ gave the model prayer in the book of Matthew, he says, our Father. That's why when you pray, you should call him Father. And when, he was, when disciples asked him, teach us to pray, he says, our Father. So we should call him our Father. <laughs> It's one of those things that Christ kind of told us to do. <laughs> you know, might want to take a hint and do it. I remember someone said that once, and I'm like, huh, I never even thought of that. I'm dumb. Our Father. Oh, he wants us to call him our Father. But then he says right after that, which art in heaven. A reminder, yo, he's our Father. Oh, but he is way beyond <laughs> what we are. Let's make sure we understand, you're in heaven, I'm on earth. You're the holy one, I'm the one of sin and filth and flesh. He is infinitely greater than we are or could ever hope to be. Our Father, yes, but which art in heaven. Oh, and then he doesn't stop there, he says what? Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. He is our Father, yes, but never forget he is the king. We do come to the Father's feet when we pray. But do not forget. Do not forget. You are coming to request from the great monarch of the universe. From the king of kings. From the lord of lords. From the ultimate ruler of eternity. That is whose feet you bow down to. He is your father, yes, but he is the Alpha and Omega. Thy kingdom. He is still to be regarded and treated as such. Throne. The throne. Let's think about some things that we can learn about prayer just from that word, throne. Throne. 
throughout histories were no stranger to the idea of royalties and thrones. Throne rooms and all the glamour and all the glory and all the honor due to the kings and the royalties. Just as all throughout history, when a person enters into the throne room of the king, they only enter if they are called or if their entrance is fraught with the lowliest of reverence. The first thing I can learn just from the throne is lowly reverence. When I go to God, I go with the lowliest of reverence. Remember who you are. When approaching the king, you pay homage and honor every step of the way. It is no small deed that you come before the king of heaven. It's no small deed that you bow before the almighty. See, the prideful that would be unwilling to acknowledge the king, it would be wise of them to stay as far away as possible because their request will have no power anyways. It'll be a waste of air. God himself said, I abase the prideful, but I exalt the humble. It would be better for the prideful. Keep your distance. Check your pride at the curb before you even enter the kingdom, let alone the throne room. Before you even enter the kingdom of God, just check the pride at the curb. Leave it there. Don't let it get anywhere near the throne room. Let the treasonous of heart and mind stay a distance away. Only the lowly reverent ones should come before the king enshrined in his majesty. That's where you're going. Every time you pray, you stand before God Almighty, robed in beauty and majesty and all the honor anything can muster. It's his and his alone. Do not forget, that's who you stand before. This is not merely a king. This is the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the ancient of days, the greatest of our emperors. Don't even hold a speck of dust to his power. And we've had some pretty powerful men throughout our history, and they can't even have a speck of dust. With all the power they had, God says, that's cute. That's the dust in the corner of my throne room. Good job. <laughs> How foolish. Monarchs have said throughout history that they have the divine right. <laughs> the divine right of kings. Oh, man. Only one rules with the divine right. And you're allowed to enter his throne room at any time. The divine right. There is one. <laughs> 1 Timothy 6.15 says, the blessed and only potentate. That means ruler. He is the, <laughs> the only ruler. <laughs> oh, we're so prideful. And we're so full of ourselves and our authority. He is so great. And we are such filth. Come before him prostrate, laying down. I am nothing. My mouth touching the floor. I don't even deserve to look up to you. That is the king of kings. Imagine him sitting on his throne. It's God's throne room, not man's throne room. The best you can imagine, the best you've seen, doesn't hold a candlestick to his throne room. His throne room is beauty and honor and majesty like we can't even imagine. Like we can't even comprehend. And every time you pray, you step foot into that throne room. See him high and mighty and sitting on his throne. And he's all ears to you. Oh, lowly reverence. He is king. 
we ought to treat him as such. <laughs> he is king. Heaven obeys him with joy. Hell trembles at his gaze. The earth, whether willing or unwilling, it will bring forth his praise. So the Bible says, even the rocks will cry forth. That's how powerful God is. And he said, come boldly to my throne. His power can make or obliterate. Everything is but an ease for him. There is nothing hard for God. There is nothing that God sweats about. There is nothing that God struggles with. It's of an ease to him. Come before him with humility. I am lowly and reverent. I don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve to stand before you. Familiarity, yes. But only with hallowedness in mind. Hallowed means reverent and respect of the utmost. That, that's like the, the highest level of respect is hallowed. It's something that's, it gives the idea of it's so special that it shouldn't even be touched. It's so important that you can only admire it from a distance. God does, God's fine with us being familiar. He wants us to be familiar coming into his throne room. But make sure it's hallowed. Make sure you don't downplay the throne room of God. <laughs> it's the most amazing place. And one day we'll get to see it. But I get to spend every day in the throne room of God. Oh, I must come with boldness, but not impertinence. Just like the three Hebrew boys. Oh, we're not careful to answer the O king. God will deliver us. But if not, see, they weren't impertinent with God. They were bold. They had the boldness of God, but they weren't impertinent. They knew, I'm not the director of God. God's not my lapdog that I snap my fingers and he comes running. But if not, O king... I trust them anyways. <laughs> See, they knew whether it's by fire or miracle, we're delivered out of your hands. Amen. You're a creature of dust. He's the ruler of heaven. And he says, come. Pray to me. How about it? When's the last time you thought about the majesty of God and your filth and iniquity and sin and putrefaction? A pile of garbage. That's all we are. And God says, Come, come boldly to my throne. Dear friend, we do not bow lowly in reverence as we ought. Do not lie to yourself. We don't. <laughs> I don't think it's possible to have enough reverence for God. <laughs> I mean, you can't get more different and more of a span of a gap than us and God. I can always learn to have more reverence for the eternal majesty. Your Highness. Those are all things that are applicable to God. He is everything. We are nothing. We're less than nothing. We're a pile of garbage and putrefaction. That's all we have. God desires our best. So when we enter into the throne, the throne room, we best enter in a lowliness of mind. As low as I can go, I need to go. As reverent as I can be, I must be. Every time we enter into the throne room, 
let us ask of the Spirit of God to teach us and put us in the right attitude so that everyone, every time we approach, it's a proper reference to the King. It's a proper place to the infinite majesty of all. How's your reverence? I know I can say of myself, I don't give God the reverence I should. How about you? When's the last time you've really thought about who God is and how pitiful I am? And he says, come unto me. Come to my throne room. The place of perfection. Bring your filth and garbage. And come to me. Let's start treating him with the utmost reverence. I am nothing. You are the highest of all. He is our father, yes. A wondrous thing we get to call God our father. But never forget. He is the king. Let's pray, dear father. I pray.